From the News Channel 5 Network, this is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. I am Ben Hall. Important topic tonight. We are talking about something that affects far too many people, medical malpractice. Happy to have with us medical malpractice attorney Clint Kelly. Clint, thank you once again for being it's here. It's good to see you again tonight. Good to see yeah. you once again. So this is always a good opportunity to kind of get a sense of what makes for a, a good medical malpractice claim and that kind of thing. But when we start talking about medical malpractice, how big of, a, of an issue is this? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. There's an article that's been out now for about three months. It was published in the British Medical Journal, and I believe the journal, the American Medical Association, has picked it up, which reports now that medical malpractice is the third leading cause of death in the United States behind heart disease and cancer. Third leading cause of death. 200,000 lives a year, and the estimate is uh, injuries are twice that amount, so you could probably come up with about 400,000 injuries a year caused by medical malpractice. What's the most common type? When we talk about medical, what's, what's the most common type of medical malpractice? What are, what are we talking about in, when, we, when we say that? Yeah, my experience has been that it is the most, the most typical kind would be a misdiagnosis. Uh, a flagrant error where there's a red flag that's missed and there are a variety of reasons for that, the patient gets sicker and either gets injured or dies. So misdiagnosis, and I mean the one I've heard of often would be a heart attack. Right. They, they should have caught the signs and they didn't. Correct. That's, that's the most obvious example of it. So then how hard are these to prove? Uh, pretty difficult to prove because in medicine uh, we always say it's an art not a science and that is true. And because of that, there are a variety of different medical causes that can be ascribed to a particular act, meaning that someone passes away and an expert may say, well, they passed away, but they were going to die anyway because they had some underlying condition other than, say, the heart attack. They, they may say the person had a blood clot, and the blood clot was primarily responsible for the death as opposed to a, a, a plaque. Uh, blocking a heart artery. So these are difficult cases. You're, you're trying cases against the best lawyers in Nashville uh, who typically hire the best legal, uh, medical experts for their legal team. Uh, so you have to be very careful about the cases that you pick. What I want to do with this time is give people a chance to call in. Maybe they've experienced something and they want to get a, a sense from you about, you know, is this something that, that could be um, taken to the next level? But what are you looking for? Let's say someone is out there. They're wondering, okay, I had this experience or that experience. Does it rise to the level of something that you could, you could pursue? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, typically what you're looking for is a big medical mistake that causes big injuries or big damages. And I use the word big because nowadays juries are much more conservative than they used to be and they require that the patient prove the case definitively, convincingly. And in order to do that, you need to be able to prove that there's been a, a really bad mistake that could have been prevented, should have been prevented, and that led to tragic consequences, an amputation, a loss of an organ, loss of eyesight, a burn, or death. Those are the types of injuries that get the jury's attention and motivate them to compensate the patient if they find there's been negligence. How long can one of these cases take? My experience is typically it's about 18 months to four years, and that depends greatly Ben, on whether the case is appealed after a verdict. And are we seeing more of this now? I mean, when you say it's the third leading cause of death, is this something that's happening more than it happened 10 years ago or 20 years ago, or are we just finding it more now? I, I think it's probably the latter. I think we're finding more of these because it used to be that, that when I started out, doctors could hide these pretty well. Uh, they could change records. Uh, they could influence what nurses said. Uh, we didn't have social media. We didn't have the internet. So the awareness of these things happening was much less. Uh, nowadays, it's harder to hide these. And people talk more. They're more knowledgeable. Consumers, I believe, are more aware of this. That's part of the reason for this show, Ben, is to educate people so they know what to look for, to know their rights. And because of that, I believe we have more cases uh, and, and more litigation. Uh, now, ironically, the number of lawsuits have gone down, even though I think the number of cases of malpractice have gone up, but I think that's simply a product of the fact that 
we have tort reform in Tennessee. Uh, a lot of us are very careful. A lot of us plaintiff lawyers are careful in the cases that we take. And so, um, and answer your question, we do have more cases of malpractice, but not more lawsuits over it. Is it also a function of doctors being overworked or too many people you know, in the system, not enough nurses, not enough doctors? I mean, are you seeing that? Or is it, are we just talking about mistakes, honest mistakes here? Kind of what leads up to those kind of issues? Yeah, well, there is, in my judgment, uh, more and more work for doctors to perform because they have to keep their incomes up. And the pressure of our health system is to put more emphasis on churning out what I call assembly line medicine. And so the, the doctor's margin for error in preventing uh, medical mistakes has shrunken over time. Also, the evolution of medicine has put a greater burden on nurses. Nurses, and particularly nurse practitioners, uh, as well as physician assistants, are taking on greater responsibilities in providing care for patients in roles that were traditionally reserved for medical doctors. And because of that, they don't have the experience uh, to treat many of the complications. That's really where experience comes to bear. Your medical doctors have experience treating and preventing complications, but some of these physician extenders like nurse practitioners don't. And that's where you see a lot of the problems. It's not the actual treatment itself, it's the complications from the treatment and the failure to handle the complications properly that can lead to tragic results. And if so, do some of the lawsuits involve nurse practitioners now, or do you go after the bigger entity there? I mean, if someone is putting a nurse practitioner out there instead of a doctor, is that where the concern is? Yeah, you'll go after both, and typically your nurse practitioner is an employee of the hospital if the injury occurred or the death occurred in the hospital. Now, there are nurse practitioners that are working in clinics across the state, across this country, and in that situation, the clinic would likely be responsible for the nurse practitioner's care as much as the nurse, and, and there's a doctor who actually supervises the nurse practitioner, and there may be some responsibility on the part of the physician for failing to supervise. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing issue for years to come as there's more and more downward pressure to have nurses make decisions that were traditionally reserved to doctors. And you talked about tort reform. Mm -hmm. How, what impact has that had on the cases you're able to bring forward? It's been substantial and primarily the reason why is that we used to take cases years ago, there's two reasons for this. First reason, we used to take cases years ago where we knew if a patient had extreme pain and suffering, a patient who's been burned badly all over their body, uh, those cases weren't capped. Uh, the amount of damages were decided purely by the jury. It was the jury's call. Now the legislature said it's our call and they've put a $750,000 cap and if you've got a 10 year old child that's burned over their entire body and you're going to keep those burns the rest of their life, I challenge anyone to say $750,000 is fair. The second reason is because of the procedural requirements that we have been um, forced to contend with at the beginning of a lawsuit have become so strict that you have to be very careful about the cases that you take and make sure that you follow those procedural requirements because if you don't, you can find your case dismissed. And uh, unfortunately, there have been a lot of cases that have been dismissed for failure to comply with the procedural requirements since tort reform went into effect years ago. What is the statute of limitations? We're talking about we want to give people a sense of, all right, what do they need to do? What are their rights? But let's say they're calling us something that happened two years ago or five years ago. What are, what, are, what are the limitations here? Statute of limitations is one year from the date that you discover your injury. So whenever it is you discover you've been injured and that there is fault that caused it, you will then have one year to serve pre-suit notice. And pre-suit notice is a prerequisite to filing the lawsuit. Um, there is a absolute bar of three years, meaning if you don't bring the claim within three years of the negligent act, your case is barred forever. So the key thing for people to remember is move quickly, make a call, ask for advice. It's free and it could be the difference between getting compensated and being shut out of court. All right, well, we're going to take a break and I want to encourage you to call in. Do you have a situation you think might be worthy of at least discussion? So we'll take a break, come back. There's the number 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. Take a break and take your calls right after this.